Willie Simmons has been connected to FBS jobs. Jackson State dominates the all-swag superlatives, and South Carolina State gets their first win of the basketball season. Oh, yeah, it's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one. Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, of course, Sam Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every single day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. It just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. And today's episode is brought to you by Sling TV that has something for everybody, especially when it comes to college football season. If you want to look at the national championship game, you want to look at the conference championship games or any of the bowl games in between, Sling TV is for you. So check out the massive lineup of games that they have all season long. Sling, the TV that you'll love at the price that you will love. Try it today. And I want to talk about FAMU head coach Willie Simmons because he's been named in the FAU, so the Florida Atlantic coaching search. And this isn't the first time that you've heard his name connected to an FBS job. He's a pretty good head coach, right? So you're going to start hearing his name connected to other places because that's just the talent level that he's at, of course. So it makes sense. Right now, it's Florida Atlantic. Before, it was University of South Florida. He's at FAMU, so it's a lot of connections within the state, and that makes sense because typically the in-state bigger schools are going to be the first one who really notice exactly who you are, right? So I'll say why I think this is important. I think it's important to amplify these stories because nationally, sometimes I get the feel that those who are not completely connected into the HBCU news all the time a lot of times it's, it becomes the feel of Jackson State and everybody else. And, and listen, I understand that Jackson State is the star of the show, so I understand why they are first on a lot of people's mind. This isn't about jealousy. This is about standing on respect and proper due. And the proper due is that, well, they're not the only people doing it. There's real talent everywhere. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of when Kendrick Lamar first came on the scene. And I remember this. I don't know why I remember this so vividly, but – uh, when Kendrick Lamar first came on the scene, dropped Good Kid, Mad City, it was, you know, it was crazy, right? So if you paid attention, you know how, how big that album was. Well, he's part of a group called Black Hippie, right? It's a, it's a conglomerate of just individual artists at TDE who are together in a group. It's not his group, but XXL labeled it Kendrick Lamar and Black Hippie. Absol, another member of the group, took massive offense to that. It was like, man, I quit, basically. Kendrick Lamar is not, it's not like, he said, it's not like 50 Cent, it's not like Lil Wayne, it's not his conglomerate and then the people he brought on. It's a group of, it's one group and Kendrick happens to be a part of it. He's just a star. That's how I feel about Jackson State and HBCUs. I just don't want it to be like, oh yeah, Jackson State's doing all of this and then other HBCUs. No, no, it's it's uh, the high rise rate, rise all boats, something like that. I've never been able to get that phrase, but it's the idea that yes, Jackson State deserves all of the praise and attention that they get, but you got to make sure that all of these other schools get amplified too. So I wanted to make sure that I note, I noted that Willie Simmons is getting a lot of praise and a lot of attention because it's not just Jackson State who's getting the calls from the bigger schools. There's some real coaches, there's some real talent on the field and on the sidelines here at HBCU. So it was important for me to amplify this story. And who knows if he decides to go to USF, because they don't have a coach still. Um, that was earlier in the month. Like, I think that was like the beginning of November, maybe the end of October, something around there. Who knows if he decides to go to FAU. When asked about USF a while back, he said, my feet are where I am. You know, right now I'm at FAMU, and I haven't heard any rumblings. And when I, if I do, then we'll deal with that when it comes. So it's really a up in the air. It's not a full commitment. It's keeping your door open like you should. That just makes logical sense. You never just close off an opportunity before it comes to you and before you even hear it. So now that FAU is supposedly rumbling, maybe he's hearing more. Maybe he is, now the season is over, maybe his agent is coming to him and telling him, hey, USF is interested, FAU is interested. Who knows? 
right? And, and who knows what his decision will be whenever that time does come to it. But like I said, I wanted to amplify these stories and we're at a, some people see this as a negative thing. I don't. I remember there was an article where they were talking about uh, HBCU coaches who are getting FBS consideration or will get it soon. Some people thought that was negative. I don't. I really don't. I, to me, it's 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 negative in a way. They have negative aspects because you're stripping a program of a pretty good head coach. But at the same time, it's just the way it is at the school that you're at. You know, this is a smaller school. There's no huge HBCUs. All HBCUs are smaller schools, period. You know, there's not a single FBS HBCU, not a single Power 5 HBCU. And that's not to mention the fact that even Power 5 schools can have their coach taken. So there's so many, you know, so many different aspects of it. But this is not a big school. And small schools have their coach taken. That's just part of it. So while it is negative, to me, that's just the way that it happens. It's just, it has, it's a negative part of just a realistic, you know, view of it. If you're a small school, understand that if you achieve a lot of success, people are going to come calling for your coach and your coach could leave and it shouldn't shock you. I don't think that's an HBCU exclusive thing. I think that's all small schools. So that's just how I look at it. And the only emotion I really get from it, because it doesn't really move me, is that, oh, I'm excited that people are acknowledging the talent of, of this coach. I'm, I'm excited that he might have what he was he what he perceives as greener pastures that's what i'm excited for but other than that it doesn't move me do i wish that he stays yeah of course of course i hope that willie simmons stays and builds a powerhouse at famu but if he doesn't see you later i wish you the best you know he's a great coach who wouldn't be knocking on his door so that's the way that i look at it to be honest and and you can't overlook what he did this year with famu right in the ship because at the beginning of the year, it was rough. And I'm not talking about, oh, well, they lost to Jackson State and they lost to North Carolina. Like, yes, those did happen. And it was about rallying off nine straight victories. But also, you had a lot to deal with at the beginning of the year. Like, there was a lot of just turbulence at the beginning of the year that he made sure to navigate with his team. That's on coaching. You got to praise him. Like, if you're going to give the negative things to coaching, you got to make sure you give the good things to coaching. And then Jeremy Musa. Jeremy Musa came in and didn't miss a beat. You know, there was no tape on this guy. I'm getting ahead of myself. But the point is that Jeremy Musa came in and he achieved success in the offense. And basically, immediately, I thought he looked good against North Carolina. And for most of the year, he sustained that level. So, you know, he, we're going to talk about him in this next segment, which is why I didn't want to get ahead of myself. But the next segment is about the all swag superlatives and then also Jeremy Musa winning the second team all swag quarterback position, which was a coveted position going into the year. Before I get into that, however, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. They have you covered this season with more odds, props, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is the number one place for all of your sports wagering. I don't care if it's basketball, I don't care if it's football, I don't care if it's uh, hockey, I don't care what it is, college sports, everything. They have everything that you need and then also the news that you need to make sure that you are educated and informed on just exactly what you're putting your money down on. Go ahead and read those up because nothing's worse than making a, a bet off of just, I think, I think, I make a bet and be like, oh yeah, I think I know that. I have more confidence with that. And that's what Bet Online provides you because they are the most versatile with all of the sports they allow, including esports, but then also they are the fastest and easiest way to wage on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. As we keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day for your second listen of the day, make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports today because I am there. I said it on yesterday's episode, I might be on there. And at the time, I didn't know what I got a call later on in the day. And here I am. So go ahead and check that out for your second listen wherever you get your podcast. And today's word of the day is motley, and it means made up of many different people or things. And that's kind of what the All Swag team is. The All Swag team is kind of a motley. It's just a motley of different individuals from a different, you know, motley of different schools, right? That's what the All Swag team is. It just all comes together. But Jackson State dominated it as far as superlatives go, especially. Um, I thought we would get this list probably next week after the all after the conference game, but we didn't. That's okay. Um, but now we know, I guess they didn't need any more time. Now we know who the best players in each category were, and that goes to Jackson State more times than not. There was four or five superlatives. Jackson State got four of them. Coach of the year, offensive player of the year, defensive player of the year, and freshman of the year. The only one that didn't go to Jackson, Mississippi, was newcomer of the year, and that was ja uh, Jarvie and Howard. And it was fun talking about if Sevignon Wilkinson could catch 
J uh, Howard for that position, but he didn't. He was still first team though. They were both still first team running backs, but they, he, you know, the Howard just got it. He had major games and he led the conference in rushing. It just made perfect sense for him to get it. Um, it was always his job to lose after about week four, or week five. Like we knew what it was after he had, I think, two all swag performances in the first five weeks of the season or something like that. We knew who the newcomer of the year was going to be, and he just continued to keep that progress. As far as the Jackson State superlatives, I think coach of the year and offensive player of the year, that those are just no brainers. Absolutely no brainers. Deion Sanders went 11 and 0, undefeated. You know, I know he won it last year, and sometimes we don't want to just give it to the same guy every single year. But if you didn't give it to him this year, it was going to be robbery. You know, maybe if Alabama State won a couple of more games, maybe if Alabama State and FAMU had switched places as far as success goes, then maybe you give it to Eddie Robinson Jr. for his first year and just how he was able to turn around the program. But that didn't happen. You're not going to give it to Willie Simmons. Um, it's Dion. You know, I just I just don't think there was many other people you could compete with him as far as narrative or success or anything like that, they came out and went undefeated. So, yes, it was going to be his job. That was the. Um, then you look at offensive player of the year, it's going to be Shador. Like, these are no-brainers. Shador is getting mentioned um, with offensive player of the year in the FCS conversations. Like, we knew he was going to be here. No-brainer, right? Now you get to Aubrey Miller, and that's where it gets uh, less certain. I think the defensive player of the year, it was one of those positions or one of those awards where it could have went to so many different people, so many different people. So it's not a no-brainer that Miller was going to get it, but it shouldn't have been a whoa moment, you know? Like, Miller is obviously, obviously um, deserving of that of that award. You know, I just think there was a lot of people who it could have went to and you just didn't know. It was up in the air. The other two, you knew it was going to be. It was no even conversation, but defensive player of the year, I think it was probably like seven names it could have been. But Miller was the best defensive player on the best defense in the, in the conference, and who knows that pushed him over the edge, but it sure, certainly is a, a nice little chip on the resume, right? Then you look at freshman of the year, and that's where it gets completely shaky. Kevin Coleman wins. And there's some people who just don't think Kevin Coleman should have won. People think Maddox out of Alabama State should have won. That's where it gets that's where it gets complicated. You know, that's the defensive back. And sometimes it's hard to really, you know, quantify how good the defensive back has been. He only has one interception. I think one pass break. Oh no, two interceptions. I think one pass breakup. But it's not that doesn't tell the whole story for a defensive back. So it's kind of hard unless you're just watching the film all the time. So Kevin Coleman won it, and he had a good freshman season. So you can't take that away from me. He definitely had a solid freshman season. It's not the Jackson State player we thought it was going to go to at the beginning of the year, but I do think if I – I think when I listed people, it could have been Kevin Coleman was another one of the names that I thought was on the list for freshman of the year candidates. So uh, pat on my back, I guess, um, even though people wouldn't have agreed with that. It's whatever. I'm still going to pat myself on the back. And then Jeremy Musa, second team all SWAT quarterback, and that was something that we were watching. Yeah, I mean, I said I had, I don't know if I said this or not, but I thought Andrew Body might be able to get that first team. But that second team spot, I thought was going to be his for sure. I thought that him and Sanders were going to be fighting now for first and second team. It didn't end up that way. Now, granted, Musa was new to the conference. Nobody had any tape on him. I, there was no reason for me to hop out and say that Musa was going to be the guy. No reason for me to do that. But after the season, it's a clear answer, right? Like, we're not that biased over here. Yes, I love TSU, and I think that Body is a great quarterback. However, Musa had the better year this year. Musa had the second most amount of yards, second most amount, uh, second most amount of touchdowns, uh, the second most amount of team success. Everything pointed to Jeremy Musa being the second team all swat quarterback, and he earned it. He earned it, man. That's just, period, that's what he is. That's what it should have been, and that's what it was. So that's how I feel about Jeremy Musa being number two. And, you know, maybe next year. Maybe next year my guy Andrew gets in there and he uh, – maybe he get, maybe I, I'll, steep, I'll keep banging that drum. Maybe he, he gets that first team or gets some first team consideration because he is an uber-talented quarterback. But this isn't about him right now. It's about Jeremy Musa and the fact that he was the second team all-swack quarterback because he came in for FAMU in his first year and he really did have a lot of success. But going forward, we're going to talk about South Carolina State switch gears over to basketball because they just got their first win of the year. And they are now 1-7. But, man, I'm telling y'all, the out-of-conference games don't matter. So don't be looking at the record. Only look at this win and what it means. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, shout-out to all my segment three folks. South Carolina State has knocked off East Carolina and really odd. I don't think I don't know if there's a West Carolina, 
But you know, I see all these schools that say North Carolina, South Carolina, like. But then you have East Carolina, and that's not a state. The other ones are. I know there's other schools, it's like West Georgia, West Florida, but there's not a North and South Florida. It's only one Florida. It's only one Georgia. I don't even know what part of Carol of the Carolinas that East Carolina is in. Like that's kind of weird to me. And I'm going to look that up while I continue talking about this because that is something that just, it just makes me a little bit curious, man. Uh, but East Carolina football, right? Well, I should have looked up university, but still. So this is about South Carolina State, though. And East Carolina is in North Carolina, for the record. I, I mean, y'all probably knew that, but I didn't know that. Um, it was a pretty nice win over East Carolina that is in North Carolina, but it's a nice change of pace because South Carolina State is a team that looked really good in the first game of the season. It looked like they were going to knock off University of South Carolina. They didn't, and after that, they didn't really put together the greatest of performances. You know, in the next six games, in between that first game and this game right here, it wasn't the greatest of performances, but you finally get back to that, that winning way. I feel like that was a winning way. You just didn't get the win in the week. I mean, in, in the first game, but these are winning ways. And now you knock off ECU. Now, hopefully you get some momentum. And now listen, they're one and seven. And I said, don't worry about the out of conference schedule because it doesn't really matter. Like it really doesn't matter. You're not going to see one in the top 25. You're just not, you know, like with Jackson state, there are what eight fam. You, they didn't make it, but they're like 24. North Carolina hit 25 at a point. North Carolina Central, excuse me, hit 25. But you're not going to see an HBCU in the top 25. You're just not. not. Not right now. Maybe one day, but not right now. And that's why this out-of-conference doesn't matter. You just got to win the MEAC. That's all that matters. And also, you're going through a murderer's row of competition every single season. I'm talking about between November to uh, January, you are going through a freaking lion's den of competition so i'm not really worried about what you look like or what your record looks like excuse me in the out of conference schedule it's just about building and this team probably needs building more than most because yes it is south carolina state's first victory of the season but it's also eric martin's first victory of his career right so he spent most of his time as a assistant on the d1 level but now he's a head coach and listen this is what win number one for him at south carolina state the coach left. They, they're really rebuilding. That's why they need this time more than anybody else. They probably need this time to figure it out. Honestly, for most HBCUs, it's probably better to hop right in the conference schedule and not have to go through this. But for South Carolina State, it's a disservice that they would have to do that. Them going through these growing pains and being able to play games that don't really hold much weight, but you're still learning, it's still practice, you're still going through things. I think it could help, you know, maybe prepare them better so that they're not still trying to gel by the time that conference schedule comes around. And in this game, they just did the best job shooting they had all year um, across the board. Overall uh, percentage, better. Three-point percentage, better. Free throw percentage, better. It was just a better day for them. You look at, especially from the three-point line, they've been shooting under 25% for the majority of the year. Under 30 for all but one game. And that's the first game. That like The first game was a solid game. And then after that, it just wasn't as good. But in that first game of the season... You shot about 40%. This game, you shoot 47. It's the best three-point shooting percentage you had all year. Like I said, most times you're under 25, so you're jumping up 20%. And the biggest person behind that, and it was a couple, but the biggest behind that was uh, LaShawn or LaShawn Hollums. I hope I said that right. Um, he was shooting pretty good from three to start the year. He was about 40% coming into this game. But in this game, he shot 80%, four for five. You know, so that percentage really helped them drive the offense going forward. You look at defensively, they had more blocks. They had more steals than ECU. They were just on the right side of basically everything. Like basically everything you wanted. You wanted to force turnovers. They did that. You wanted to make sure you, you're knocking down shots. You wanted to be efficient. They did all of that. You wanted to make sure that you were limiting second chance points. I think there was only two second chance points by ECU on the day. They just played really good basketball, South Carolina State did. And if they can continue this, you're going to be looking for them. I can't wait to see how they take this victory and kind of transport it into conference play. I know it's a while away, but I can't wait to see how they do that because you look at Texas Southern, who knocked off Florida last year, these games do translate. 
I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day on tomorrow's episode, Mo Carter should be joining us to talk about the just massive amount of players from Alabama A&M and the Norfolk State who are entering the transfer portal. What's going on with that? What's going on in both of these schools? But yes, I appreciate that. For your second listen of the day, if you want to continue seeing my face or hearing my voice, go ahead and check out Locked On Sports Today wherever you are listening right now. Don't even leave the app. Just type in Locked On Sports Today as I'm talking to you and press send when I am done. But yes, in the meantime, in between time, I appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every single day. And if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.